Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations in all of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. We are here at the first Sunday of Lent. It was just last week, we were talking about the transfiguration of Jesus, about that important vision the disciples had of where Jesus' face was changed, his, his clothes were changed, and we had Ash Wednesday service that kicked off the beginning of Lent, and here we are on this journey, this 40-day journey together. We don't always identify each Sunday in the church or each special occasion, but in the late winter and the early spring, just about every service we have has a official or unofficial title. We have Transfiguration Sunday and Ash Wednesday. Later on, we'll have Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and then Easter Sunday. This Sunday in the liturgical calendar is oftentimes described as Temptation Sunday. In Temptation Sunday, it's because the liturgy always puts us into one of the gospel's accounts of Jesus going out into the wilderness, being there for 40 days, and undergoing temptation. And we're going to talk about temptation a lot today, but really we're going to talk about identity and what it means uh, to have an identity and what our identity is in Christ. So as we hear from Luke chapter 4 verses 1 through 13, I want you to hear the temptation narrative, but I also want you to hear the truth of identity that is spoken of throughout this passage. So with open ears and a soft heart, let us listen to Luke chapter 4. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. May this God's word speak to our hearts, our minds, our spirits. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we're going to talk a little bit about temptation, a lot about identity. I asked the Saturday night service, the 5 o'clock service, and the 8.30 service this morning. We're going to have a little interaction since most of us were not able to join one another in, in church last Sunday because of the weather. The question is, who are you? If I were to ask a question, who are you? You get that question all the time. You might say, what do you do? Or who are you? Tell me, who are you? You can shout it out. I mean, the kids aren't shy. You should not be shy either. A child of God, you just jumped right to the end, didn't you? Yes. Yes, you get a gold star. But yes, you are. It's a child of God. So let's put that over here because that's where we're going to be going. What else are you? A mom, grandparent, sister, daughter, son, cousin, retired. 
Amen, right? It's tempting sometimes. And what I heard last night is some folks shared, well, I, I run or I read or I serve. Other people said, well, I, I'm a relation and my relationship to, to people, that's my identity. What I have not heard from any place is vocation. Your job is your identity. Yet, people will ask, so tell me about yourself. And the first thing we say is, I'm a teacher, I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor, I'm an engineer, I'm a pastor. And so the question of identity is a tricky one. It is a tricky one because at our core, our identity is what we heard at the first. We are a child of God. The temptation of Jesus is a complete question of what is his identity. We start off our passage today thinking about where we were just a week ago. A week ago, we had that two steps forward moment of Jesus going up the mountain. Anytime there is a mountain at top mentioned in the Bible, it means the divine is coming close. There is something godly about to happen. He goes up with Peter and John and James, and, and as they're on the mountain, his appearance of his face changes. His, his clothes change. They become dazzling white, illuminatedly bright. And there with him is Moses and Elijah, and then a cloud, this divine presence, the cloud engulfs all of them. And the voice of God says, this is my son, the chosen one, listen to him. We had that mountaintop experience last week in the liturgy, and then we have, it feels, a step back into the wilderness. But even if we go to the third chapter of Luke, the story that immediately precedes today's reading. Jesus is at the Jordan River. Jesus goes there and he encounters John the Baptist and he submits to being baptized. Now the baptism normally meant it was for the forgiveness of sins. It was being washed clean, but Jesus had no sin. He did not require being baptized, but he was baptized so that he might be an example toward us. And so he goes under the water. He comes out, and the Scripture describes heaven being opened up, torn open, and the Holy Spirit descending like a dove upon him, and the voice of God, of the Father, saying, This is my Son, the Beloved. With him I am well pleased. And so we go from that, and it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, goes out into the wilderness. It says the Spirit doesn't lead him to the wilderness. The Spirit leads him through the wilderness. The Spirit is with him in the wilderness. And so again, it feels like there's two steps forward and there's one step back. But here is where the temptation comes in. And it's easy to write ourselves into the story and think that the sermon we need to hear and, and the sermon I preached before, the sermon that certainly we might expect is to be careful with temptation. And it's true, be careful with temptation. But there is the temptation of Jesus. And think about the various temptations we go through. And if you can't identify many of those, well, the answer is probably because you give in to them before they even become loud enough for you to hear. In reality, the world has become one giant supermarket checkout line. And remember that as a kid, and even when you have kids or grandkids, you go through that impulse buy section, you know, filled with candy and with, with gum and with batteries and with all these other things. And that question of, can I just get this thing? It's only a dollar. Can I just get this? It's only, you know, 50 cents. And what has happened in our lives is that our whole world has has become right at our fingertips through technology. If we want something, we can have it immediately. We can have it delivered, a meal delivered in 30 minutes. We can have a package delivered in a day or two or even same day service. We don't really sit with temptation very often because there's immediacy to what is going on around us. But we're in a period where we talk about self-denial. Self-denial where we say, I'm giving this up for Lent or I'm not going to do that during Lent. And as I've gotten older, I've made the, the realization that God doesn't care if you give up chocolate for Lent. God does not care, frankly, if I only drink water, if we only drink water during Lent. God really is not either more glorified or less glorified if we give up something, but it has a direct impact on our own lives. 
it has a direct impact on our own lives. Because what we find out is the things that are created around us are the things that become the things that we rely on for comfort. Creature comforts. Those things that are conveniences in some ways become an idolatrous identity. That thinking that we are the sum of our stuff, the sum of our things. And, it, and that's a tempting thing. It really is, and especially in Western culture, to say you are what you do or you are what you have. And last week in Alabama and Georgia and other places, there was a tornado. And, and, and really with our family, we can never really separate ourselves and our experiences in Joplin from the pain of other people who have gone through this. There is a hard empathy, a hard come by empathy for what people are going through. And for those who lost loved ones, we grieve. And, and for those who lost everything, but but their loved ones are alive or they escape with their lives, there are those interviews. And I'm always amazed at people in those interviews. They're standing in front of their home, which is completely destroyed, where all their, their valued possessions are gone. And while they express sadness at the loss of neighbors in their lives, none of them are saying, boy, I wish I had this item, or boy, I wish I had that. What they are thankful for are their life. They're thankful for their family. They're thankful for their neighbors. They're thankful for community. And it's interesting because you can have those things that, that are unexpected that come upon us that are, are truly horrific, these violent winds and these, and these storms that can knock over houses and can take away all possessions. But the people who make it through there are not worried about what is lost. They're thankful for what they have. This is what Lent forces us to do when we give things up. We start looking a little bit more inside and we stop relying on the things that are around us and we trust more in God. And maybe just maybe it is the need to go at, be led out by the Spirit into the wilderness to where we're going to hear God's truth on that just a little bit louder. Because our identity matters. And I mentioned earlier that this was a story about temptation, about the devil coming to Jesus, but it really is a story about identity. Because the very first question that, that Jesus was asked by Satan, that Satan asked, the devil asked, and he said, he said, if you are the Son of God, it's been 40 days, you've had no food, turn this loaf, or this, this rock into a loaf of bread. And, you know, we know how good bread smells especially if you're on a low-carb diet or you're, you're doing something keto-friendly or, or whatever the, the new thing is. But the smell of bread, it sells homes. It does so many things. It's, and, and, you know, like Pavlov's dog, you know, you might even start salivating right now thinking about that loaf of bread and how good it must have, have tasted right now, but, but especially after 40 days. But Jesus says, it's a, man doesn't live by bread alone. They live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. But the question that the, the devil's asking, he's, he's not saying if, as if saying like, well, if you are the Son of God. Really, the way this is translated in the Greek is since you are the Son of God. Since you are the Son of God, prove it. And then Jesus passes that test. The second temptation is that the devil says, look at all the kingdoms of the world. I have all the authority and power. Now, I don't know how much that is true, or what the devil is, is saying right there, there are, frankly, there are days where I believe it. There are days that I look out at the world and I, and I wonder, just wonder and say, what is going on with so much evil and, and even that happening in, in leadership? And, and you say, where is God in all of this? But yet I still believe this is my father's world. And, and the whole point that even though the wrong seems off so strong, that God is the ruler still yet. But the devil says, I have control over all of this stuff, all these kingdoms. If you bow down and worship me, you'll have it all. Now this is extremely tempting for Jesus because what the devil is offering is the crown without the cross. He's saying you can have this power without the suffering. But what the devil is offering is power. And what Jesus and why Jesus said no is Jesus, he never came for power. He came for authority because authority is borne out not by something that we claim by might. It is by our actions of humility, our actions of our character that give us that, give us that authority. 
Finally, the devil takes him to a uh, highest point, the pinnacle of the temple, and says, throw yourself off. And he quotes scripture. It's funny how the devil can quote scripture. I hear scripture quoted all the time incorrectly. I hear it quoted by politicians. I hear it quoted by folks I see on the street or hear on television. Frankly, I hear it quoted all the time incorrectly, in my opinion, from pulpits. And he quotes scripture and he says, throw yourself off and the angels will catch you. The scripture says so. You're not going to dash your heel against the stone. They've got you. And at last, Jesus says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And then the devil left him. And the scripture says, until there was an opportune time in the future. There is a temptation among us to think that our identity is in what we do for a living. There is a temptation in our lives to think our identity is in what we own. Our identity is in our bank accounts, on our driver's license, and our business cards. But at Genesis chapter 1, we are told that we are created, the very beginning, we are created in the image of God. The first thing any one of us is, is created in love. And we are loved. But we know someone else at the 830 service, I won't mention who, he said, what is your, wh who are you? He's a definition of your identity. And he said, a sinner. And later on, he came up to me and said, I should have said redeemed sinner. I said, it was good what you said. But our identity is sinner, and we know we are. And we know we are. We know we get off the right path, but we are still loved. We are still claimed. We are created in love. We are redeemed in love. We are told in Romans chapter 8, the question, what is going to separate us from the love of God and Jesus Christ? The answer is neither height nor depth, nor things present, nor things to come, nor anything else in all of creation will separate us from the love of God and Jesus Christ, which is to say that God created you in love. God knows your sin, and God still sent Jesus, and God's not going to let you go. We have to, we have to fight the temptation, the temptation to prove that we are worth loving. We have to fight the temptation to try to show externally what is our internal identity. Because what happens when we try to prove that we are loved is we consume more, we take more, we try to show off more, we try to pull ourselves up by putting people down. This does not honor God in any way, shape, or form. Our identity before anything else is child of God, created, redeemed, sustained in love. There is a temptation to accept less. But there is so much more that God says to you. Of course we're supposed to flee temptation and temptation will flee from us. But I hope more than anything else, if you hear anything else in the sermon today, flee the temptation to try to prove yourself and harm yourself and others in the process. Accept that you are loved. Accept that light in all things. And as you go out, you will be a light to yourself and a light to the world. There will be storms and there will be sickness around you. It will feel sometimes like you are taking two steps forward and one step back. But the Holy Spirit that was there at creation is the Holy Spirit that was with Jesus in the baptism, was the Holy Spirit that was with Him in the wilderness. The Holy Spirit has not left us and will not leave us. May you accept that you are accepted. And in doing so, may you have a love as generous for the world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.